Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Thanks for joining me again, Fading Memories listeners. You know I always appreciate your time and your ears. I have today my first Australian guest. They are recording from the future for us. Yeah. And <laughs> uh, it's kind of exciting to talk to somebody on the whole other side of the world. Uh, with me is Stephen Hunt. He is the co-founder of Music Health. It's an app that is designed for many mental health purposes, but it's also got a connection for those of us taking care of a loved one with dementia. So thanks for joining me, Stephen. Do you go by Steve or Stephen? Uh, Steve. So okay. Stick with that, Jennifer. <laughs> um, the, what do you the little doing? Zoom box says Stephen. So. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me about yourself. Before we were before I hit record, you were giving me the details on your family history of lovely diseases like mine. So start yeah. wherever you'd like to start with. Yeah, well, I'm, I might just start with um, so Music Health as a, as a company. We started it with a mission to reintegrate music into healthcare. And the premise here is that if you look at any ancient human civilization, whether it be the Aztecs, the Incas, or the indigenous people of Australia, they all use music to heal. And so this has been going back over 40,000 years. In fact, the Indigenous people of Australia used one of these, it's called a didgeridoo, um, as part of healing. It's, it's the oldest recorded form of music therapy, which dates back 40,000 years. Now, we've forgotten all about that because we invented pharmaceuticals and we just now prescribe a drug and hope that's going to fix the problem. Uh, but we really see it our, in our company that there's an opportunity to reintegrate music into healthcare very broadly. And we're starting with dementia because in dementia, music is actually more powerful and more transformative than any pharmaceutical and as we know, most pharmaceuticals aren't really making any difference with dementia. We've, we're nowhere near a cure. Nothing's really cutting through. We're kind of just treating little symptoms here and there. And, and often the people that we start to work with have this massive cocktail of drugs they're on that are trying to compensate for each other's side effects. And it's just their brains are even more scrambled. Um, so, But we've seen with music that it can completely transform them. And I guess what drew me to this is, as you said, a, a personal connection. My grandfather experienced Alzheimer's disease when I was in my teens, and I was watched him go through that progression with my grandmother who was caring for him. And as I'm sure everybody who listens to this would know, that's really heartbreaking for anybody to experience and incredibly difficult. Um, but I was a musician. As you can see, I've got a few instruments behind me. And, um, and I used to play him music. And it used to soothe him and kind of change and transform him. And at the time, I had no idea why. I didn't know the science of it. But but anyway, but um, my grandmother also developed dementia but lived to the age of 100, so I think she was entitled to lose a few memories there. Um, and, um, and yeah, and I, I was working in the music industry and uh, a good friend of mine who was a, who's now my co-founder, Nick, um, came to me one day with the film Alive Inside. And I don't know, have you ever seen it? Yeah. Um, I haven't seen it, but I actually did an episode about it with a gentleman that was involved. Amazing. So it's if you don't want to watch the whole thing, which I do highly recommend, bring the tissues. Um, but if you, if you don't have time, even just going on YouTube, you could watch a few short clips and you'll get the idea. Um, but that film was... Um, demonstrating the music and memory program, which um, which is incredible, and that, that inspired us. So, what you what you see is this transformative effect of someone who is experiencing dementia, is quite lost in space and time. They don't know where they are. Um, they don't know who their carers are. They're, they're probably feeling a little afraid, and and that fear can manifest into either you know regretting regressing. Sorry, into anxiety and depression or expressing in a much more aggressive and agitated manner. And, and neither of those are good, um, but both are, are very difficult to manage for a carer. And when they play music to these people that is from their past, that's personally significant to them, 
they become alive, and hence the name of the movie. It it quickens them. It kind of transforms them like no drug ever could, and they they seem, seem to come back. They seem to get a better use of their faculties. They can move their body. They can talk. They can swallow and eat, um, and they can remember faces much more readily because what's happening is the music is stimulating their long-term memory and for some reason, Alzheimer's and dementia doesn't really affect the musical memory. They, they remain intact. Same with poetry. It's kind of two really weird things. Like you'll find people who can't remember their wife and can't even remember their own name can just recount poems if they've learned them and sing along to songs. And um, and it's beautiful to watch. And, and when we get them into that stimulated state, inviting them to maybe come and do hygiene care and have a shower or to take some medication or to eat their food becomes so much easier um, because you've got somebody who is much more aware of where they are in space and time. They're much less likely to feel anxious and, and, and scared and therefore you can actually engage and interact with them much more readily. So, so we created an app called Vera and that's our first product which is designed for the carers of people living with dementia to be able to get this effect as easily as possible and do it as often as possible as well. And, and we see in a really advanced state that the carer is using the music when the person wakes up to help them get dressed and out of bed and get them moving. They're using it to set the scene for, for meals. They're using it to, to set the scene for washing and hygiene, as I said, um, all these different things and even conversing and spending time with people because when these songs come up that they recognize, they bring along beautiful memories and um, and we can talk about those and relive them with the person. And some of the most beautiful things I've seen in my work are when the family members are hearing memories for the first time that the songs have triggered and they're like, oh, we didn't even know about that, you know, and that's such a beautiful thing to get when, you know, your family member often at that stage can't even remember who you are um so so yeah that hopefully that gives you a bit of a summary of the journey so far and what we're trying to do well and we're going to get into it a little bit more but i truly wish you guys had been around when my mom was still alive i had talked to a musician I think he was also a singer and we we talked about my struggle of finding mo music that my mom connected to i tried you know, the era that she was in high school and maybe m music that I remembered being played in the home when I was a kid, although I think most of that was my dad. And it just, he suggested this one past guest, he's like, well, you'll probably have to go through a hundred songs to find, you know, five to 10. And I was like, I can't even come up with a hundred songs that seem to be even close. So that was the first struggle. I did have a little success when I, I thought back to my childhood and what my grandmother played when we were at her house. And I figured if I could remember it, then maybe it would work with my mom. And it, it it had it was better than the previous attempts, but it was it was so frustrating and so I didn't get what you were talking about just a moment ago, so I gave up. But yeah. you guys have I think have solved that problem to That's some right. degree. And, and, and the other challenge is I know when she was living in the care home. They didn't, I don't think they played the right era of music. Now, my mom was on the younger end. They did have residents there that were probably 20, 25 old, years older than my mom. My mom died at 77. So, mm. you know, it wasn't too terribly difficult to be 20 years older than her or 15 years older. And so I don't think she connected to any of that. But in getting ready for this talk, I was talk telling my husband, eh, I think that tomorrow's guest is from <laughs> Australia. That'll be interesting. And we were talking about the music and he's like, well, mom really loved big band. And I'm like, yeah, she did. But that's not necessarily from her era. It's not the era that I would have picked. Yeah. But then when he said that, I was like, why didn't I try that? Or did I try that? So why don't you tell us how the app makes yeah. all of that easier? Absolutely. I, I think firstly, I'd love to say that playing any music is great. Like music is absorbed by the brain. It comes in through our ears actually it has to cross the hemispheres and then there's about five or six different parts of the brain that have to work in concert to interpret what we perceive as music. It's not just, you know, hearing a sound and making a quick response. Um, 
So it's a bit of a brain workout. And it's why we generally feel quite pleasurable when we're hearing something, especially if we like it, of course, there's taste. And we'll get in, get into that in a second. But but first and foremost, even if you don't know exactly what to play, playing something is better than nothing generally. And then um, the second thing I wanted to sort of say first is that that's what music and memory started to do uh, like decades ago. So they've been going around with um, volunteers and musicologists and trying to do exactly what you were doing. They're manually getting to know the person, researching them, working out where they lived and then what songs might have been big in that location at that time when their musical taste was forming. And generally the, the, the kind of key age you want to try to get back to is 15 through to 35. Now, the problem with 15 through to 35 for someone like yourself is you probably, if you were alive and you probably were for a little bit, you weren't really old enough to remember much. And most of your mum's music experience that you would have been um, in knowledge of was when she was a parent and she'd been playing music probably for you. And um, and also that gets into a very different time where we started to get um, moved away from records into cassettes and things like that. If we go back into when your mum would have been 15 through to 35, there's a chance she might have had some records at home to play for herself. But I would hazard a guess that most of what she did here came through the radio. And either that or it was what she was exposed to in the town that she grew up. And so what we do is we analyse some really simple bits of information. So where was the person born? Where did they live when they grew up from 15 through 35? And you can put multiple countries, multiple places, because obviously not everyone stays in one place. Um, what languages do they speak? Because that can be really interesting. And, um, and then from there, with that information, we actually can build a pretty good starting point of looking at what was popular either on the charts. We could look at what was popular from touring bands. We could look at what was popular from radio plays. And we've created a massive database that syncs up all of that information attached to every song from the Universal Music Library, which is the world's biggest music library, um, and it's got millions of songs. So that's that's our secret source in the back background that has taken us um, a huge amount of technology to build. It actually takes an AI technology to to listen to the song and to decide if it's going first of all if it's going to be relaxing or energizing or you know what what kind of emotional response will the song elicit. That's the first thing we work out. And then the AIs are also scraping the internet, looking for that other information about popularity all the time and building up richer and richer strings. So then when we get to those questions I asked um, in the onboarding, which are where was the person born, when were they born, and where did they grow up, we can very quickly understand what were the popular songs around them in that place during those years. And then if we know, we ask do they have any favourite genres? Do they love classical or blues or reggae or rock? And do they have any favourite artists? Sadly, we don't often get that information if the family aren't involved. And quite often in the um, residential aged care settings, they're not. And so that's a real shame. But as I said, as a starting point anyway, we'll have a collection of songs which are separated into three stations. One is to help that person relax. Another is to help that person get energized and motivated to get up and move. And then a third one is to help that person reminisce and, and find their own memories. And they get presented um, from just those basic questions. And then you've got a thumbs up and a thumbs down, of course, so that if a song creates a really great reaction and the person knows the words and they're clapping along, we hit like. And if we want to, we can also leave a little note and say, oh, they loved it, they were clapping along, it reminded them of their wedding day, whatever it may be. And we can save that song. And every time we do that, it, it gets pulled into the reminisce playlist so we can go back to those songs we know they know, we know they love, and we collect those over time. But we're constantly trying to find more through the Energize and Relax playlists as well, which are um, pushing forward new songs. So with that, we tend to find that we, we get about 50 to 75% hit rate um, in the first go, and then we're refining over time. But, but it really is that simple. It's just understanding the music that was really popular around that person in that stage of their life 
Um, but to do that, because we've got customers who were born in China, we've got customers who were born in Japan, in Italy, in France, in Yugoslavia, you never, all over the world. So we've had to do this globally and look at this popularity metric across all genres, all songs, and all places. And that's been really the hard part. But now that we have that, the, the experience is simple and easy. My mom might have been a little easier. She was born in Northern California, lived her whole life in Northern California. Not all the same town, but the same region. Okay. Basically, the San Francisco, the greater San Francisco Bay Area. Perfect. I'm trying to remember. Yeah, nope, she never lived anywhere else. So, <laughs> but I'm, I'm, as you're talking, I'm remembering stories. So my maternal grandfather was an army chef during World War II, he had damaged his trigger finger with a um, a saw. Okay. I don't know what the, it's not, maybe it was a hacksaw. Um, it didn't stop him from hunting, but it stopped him from being shipped overseas. My grandfather could open the fridge and you, most people would open the refrigerator and say, oh, there's nothing really much to eat in here. And he could whip out the best sandwiches. You'd be like, I didn't see that tomato. Where'd you pull that tomato out of? And I have inherited that. So obviously he his family also owned a restaurant and a bakery. So that, that comes up through the genetics, I'm assuming. But when he was not home, my mom would run up to other soldiers and, and go, daddy, daddy. So the as we were talking earlier, you know, my husband was like, oh, she, my you know, mom liked big band music, which not, wasn't necessarily her era. Um, mm. She graduated from high school in 1960. So 15 to 35 would have been, um, I should probably use the calculator for this math, but she would have been 1960. So like 1957 through, I'm not sure when she was 35. She was born in 1943. I can't do math that fast in my head. <laughs> That's um, 1958, should we start? And then we're looking another 20 years, so 58 to... Um, 78. To, yep, so that's the era. So you'd pick up things like Sinatra and that, you know, My Way was kind of pretty big in those in that 50s era. But, but again, you know, if you love a big band, that's something you might know and you can suggest a favourite artist or two. Um, the system will look outside that that area, it will just kind of start there and over time explore more and more. And um, and we see people with dementia, unfortunately, you know, as young as 40, my age, I'm, I'm 42. And it's, you know, I, when we created the app and the experience, we kind of didn't even think that was possible. We, we really thought about everything being for someone who's 60 or older. And, and in the first iteration of the app, you couldn't actually even if you were 40, you couldn't put your birth, date of birth in because we hadn't, <laughs> we, we had it cut off. And, um, um, but, you know, it's interesting. So we're, we're really having to analyse a lot more music now to get to that younger age group. And, and as time goes on, it, it's probably one other thing just to think about when you, I explained what happens in the background. The amount of recorded music in the 1920s was say this and then 30s 40s 50s 60s 70s 80s 90s like it gets exponentially larger until today we've got you know ai writing it all the time and flooding us with uh new music so it's um it's something which becomes a bigger and bigger task for us as time goes on but also gives us much more data to get much better and better at our recommendations well what's interesting obviously you put in where they were born, where they lived and all that, because um, regionally music is very different in the United States. You know, Northern California is probably, I mean, well, it depends on the person as well. You know, you could have rap and hip hop, blues, uh, country, rock and roll, classic rock, alternative, pop music. I'm probably missing a jumble of stuff. Gospel. You know, I mean, there's just like, there's a lot of, a lot of different genres of music. And what I didn't think of with mom, and it's, I think, I don't know why, I, I must have just made this process just too hard for myself. I was, was, I was too much in my head and not in, in hers as much as I should have been. But when I was growing up, my mom liked to play the organ, like, you know, the kind that you would have in church. I'm not really sure why that was her thing, but she did enjoy that. So I would have to kind of go back 
and figure like figure out what she played. But the other thing that she that I I knew she would connect with was Christmas music, and I'm like, I am not playing Christmas music in July. I'm just not doing it. <laughs> it's like bad enough the stores start playing it in October before Halloween. Just not doing it. Um, and I don't think I ever tried after that because it was just like it was just like this mental block. I'm not playing Christmas music all the time. <laughs> If you um yeah if you want a, a surefire hit with well with anyone in the Western culture that is um, sing Happy Birthday <laughs> you know that's something everyone knows and you're right Christmas songs particularly the big carols everybody's sung those too so um, but again like if if I was working with someone in a care facility who'd grown up in Japan and had only come out in the last sort of 20 years or so that still may not resonate so so it's really important that you kind of respect people's cultural and linguistic backgrounds and and that diversity but um but yeah but I think you know for most of your listeners who are probably born in the U.S. and grown up there that those those are really great place to start and the listenership is fairly robust with North um North America. There we go. I knew I was going to say, I was trying to, I started saying North and I think California. And despite what a lot of people think, we are really not our own country, although sometimes we'd like to be. Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, we're the fifth largest economy in the world. So, you know, it's a pretty special place, in my opinion. It's why I'm a multi generational Californian, which is a rare breed. I like to, I like to tell people that sometimes because I mean, you probably don't meet too many people like me. I know I, um, it goes back at least three generations, and I got to find out about my great grandmother because I don't know. If- I, I lived there for three years, um, and my daughter, my youngest child, was born there in LA. So we called her Mila, which in my LA, Mila, I guess you'd say in in your accent. And um, but the, the the midwife when she was born said, "Oh, after the beer." Uh, <laughs> I was like, "No, no, no, no." Um, and, but we always joke that it stands for "Made in LA," but it's, that's not really what the name. <laughs> that's cute. Well, I don't know how much you got up to Northern California, but Northern California and Southern California have very much their own regional differences. We even have yeah. slightly different dialect. <laughs> yeah, I, I I had a team in um, uh, the Bay Area in Emeryville, Oakland. Yep. So I was there almost weekly seeing them, and um, and then I used to have clients up. Um, I actually had to go up to Portland, Seattle, but like traveled up quite a lot. I know they're not California anymore, but um, but I spent a lot of time up the North End, and um, and recently I was over there last year a lot for the business. We were part of a an accelerator at Berkeley Skydeck, and um, so we were at Berkeley University for. Well, the program went for five months with with my kids. I was back and forth, but I probably spent about three months of the year there. And um, and there was one point when we were a bit low on cash and we couldn't afford a hotel or anything. So I hired a car and I slept in the car for a, <laughs> a couple of weeks. But because I had this car to sleep in and it was it had a bed, it wasn't like, you know, just sleeping in the back. But it um, I started exploring the northern coast and it was incredible. And I was getting up to like Eureka and those kind of areas and um, Tahoe, exploring those parts. It was magic. Well, so I'm an hour north of Sacramento and an hour south of Lake Tahoe. Truckee. Almost. Truckee's not. Truckee's about 40 minutes away, I believe. Right. Cool. Uh, Tahoe City is about half an hour away, which awesome. is where you can go up to the lake. But my mom was born in Alameda, so that's next to Oakland. Yeah, I know Alameda well. <laughs> it's a well. It's got the well. It had the was it a naval base or an air base or both? Must have been a naval base still in the water. Yeah, naval base. Pretty sure <laughs> it's been closed a long time. I can't. They have a, a great antiques fair there nowadays. <laughs> yep, some really cool breweries too. <laughs> that's uh, my husband's end. I'll I'll look at the all the nice stuff to buy and he can have the beer. <laughs> so do you have um, some stories with clients that have utilized Vera? And and so you could tell tell us some of those because I, li- I like stories that are better than I, I tried to figure out what music my mom would connect to and I failed. Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains. I was frustrated. 
I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about Neuro Reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. No, that's okay. It's hard. It's, um, you know, unless you're a musicologist and, you know, you have all of that deep understanding of millions of songs that exist, it's it's really difficult. Um, but that problem is what we've solved. Um, but to your point about use cases, uh, probably the, the best story um, is actually when we first started so we had this idea, we'd seen music and memory, we'd realized how manual and hard it was, and we thought, hey, with modern technology, we could we could make this available to anyone who needs it. And that's probably the real crux of why we exist is music therapy is incredible, but it's there's a, such a shortage of music therapists. There's nowhere near enough people getting trained. And then even if they are trained, it's expensive. Someone's got to pick up the tab for it. And um and it's not something you can do on demand. So it's there was this kind of real challenge of how can we complement what music therapists do but make it available to anyone who needs it at a very affordable price. And, um, and so the first thing we did was we entered the idea into a competition called Decoding Dementia. And this was funded by the Australian government and, um, and it was auspiced by a charity here called Dementia Australia and we won. Um, we didn't have a product. We didn't even have a company. We had an idea. And with the idea, they, they gave us $50,000 Australian in research funding. And they said, go and prove this idea. And so we created a prototype and um, nothing too special. It was definitely not on an app store or anything like that. Um, in fact, you had to use a computer. It was on a web browser and you'd hook up a speaker to it. Anyway, very rough prototype, and we deployed it into a residential aged care facility specialising in dementia. And over two weeks, we did the research, and the results were incredible. Um, on average, we lifted quality of life, which was the measure they were using, uh, by 17%, and that was measured using something called the DemQual proxy. And, and there was one gentleman there called Roy, and Roy had been in the facility for almost a decade and yeah and for the last five years his daughter who would come to see him very regularly um he couldn't remember her so she dutifully would show up but felt it was quite depressing for her because she couldn't really connect with him anymore and he just treated her like a stranger um the last two years unfortunately he hadn't even been able to speak anymore. He was nonverbal. And as we started to use Vera, or the early version of it, with Roy on a day-to-day -day basis, he started to perk up the music you could see visibly, you know, he'd sort of light up, he'd start tapping along the thing. And then he started speaking again. And then by the end of the trial, he had started telling us stories about memories attached to the songs and he'd recognised his daughter again. Wow. And he was telling her stories about her childhood that she didn't know. And it was just one of those beautiful moments and it compelled her, his daughter to write to us explaining the experience she'd had. And, um, and of course, the thing to notice is that the, the, if this effect, the, the memory recall and all these things, it will fade away once the music stops. It's it's the music is stimulating the brain, as I explained. 
if you look at this on an MRI scan, it's like the Christmas tree is turning on. But once the music stops stimulating, it, it just slowly fades away over about half an hour and then that person will be back to normal. So we're not talking about a cure here. Just want to stress that. But it's incredible therapy. And um, and so, so that for us was like the big moment where we went, right, this is super powerful, um, much more effective than any drug, but look at the connection and the impact that it's having on the people. And so we went and raised some money and created the company and we got on the app store, I think it was around about June, July last year. So it took us quite a while to get there and build it all out. But, um, but yeah, but that's, that's probably my favorite story because that was right at the beginning. And that was the, the the big turning point that really gave us the um the motivation to go for it. Um and the other thing I'd probably mention is we've seen in subsequent um patients now that we're decreasing the use of psycho um psychoactive drugs. And that to me is like a again, a really heartwarming validation of what's happening. So as I said, sometimes people are on these incredible cocktails of some drug to stop them getting anxious, but then another drug to stop them getting depressed. And you, you're kind of pushing and pulling the valence of this person all over the place. And you can imagine their brain is just scrambled more than it already is. And so to see people being able to use music or the carer more, being able to use music to control the emotional swings and those behavioral symptoms of dementia um, and not necessarily need so much medication is is really, really uh, amazing as well. I'm just stunned at the story that he went from nonverbal to remembering stories of her childhood. That just that just kind of blows my mind. Yeah, it blew our but mind. You said so was- it's temporary. So is there a diminishing return? So if you play the music for an hour, you might you'll get an hour maybe of yeah, you know, you know what you're talking about, but if you played it for four hours, does that just like overstimulate the brain and it just says no, thank you, and they go back to their baseline? I mean, what's the yeah. it's, what's it's, the purpose? Oh, sorry, it's like we have a big enough zoom lag between California and Australia, so I'm assuming you wouldn't want to just play music continuously. Well, you can, and um, to your point about um, whether there's you know this lags or not. The the music is always changing. So some songs are triggering a memory and others maybe they're just tapping along to. And so it's, it's probably the same. You could experience this for yourself if you just played a, a, a set list of songs from an era gone by, songs you haven't heard in 10 or 20 years. Some of them are going to make you prick up and go, oh, this, yeah, I remember this one. And some of them will make you sing along, but others you might just kind of enjoy in the background and um and so that's that's kind of what's happening. It's the amount of stimulation is completely personal. And experiences like Roy's are unfortunately not that common. They happen, I'd say, five to 10% of the time. Um, but for everybody, we see lifts in mood, improvements in sleep, um, and and those a reduction in those things like anxiety and aggravation and so on. And so so there's a universal benefit. But there's also a scale of the benefit. And some people show a small amount, like perhaps your mother was probably down that end anyway, and maybe it was never going to, even if you played the most perfect music for her, it might not have impacted her that greatly. But then for someone like Roy, obviously, it had a profound impact. And um, But, yeah, we, we when we deploy Vera into an aged care facility, we normally walk into a place which is quite depressing for anyone to walk into. Um, it's sterile. The audio that you're hearing is often screams of pain from a distance, or you might hear, you know, people kind of moaning quite a lot. And you'll also you'll hear some other uncomfortable sounds, sometimes some medical things like beeps and so on, or a lot of background TV, just blah, 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 blah. And it is not a beautiful audio environment to walk into. And we try to teach them that every single sound you hear as a human elicits an emotional response. Every single one. It's how our brain was built. It was built to be able to quickly detect if there's danger there or if we're safe. And so when you, that's why living in a city can be stressful because you're hearing all these sounds. Your brain is constantly trying to work out, is that dangerous or not? Um, But if you're living in 
you know, the forest. You're just hearing beautiful things and as long as a bear's not coming at you, you're, you're <laughs> generally, generally feeling safe and, and really happy. And when you go into these environments and a, a hospital is the same, the audio that is stimulating you is generally having a negative impact. And so when we when they understand this and we start to change the audio environment and we call it like a sound bath, you know, just even in the foyer or in the communal space, playing music and shutting the TV off or, in, or if you want to keep it on, maybe put on like a nature documentary on mute and have the music in the background, some classical music, make it a beautiful film clip for them. But, you know, that changes the way people feel. And when you're dealing with these escalating behaviours towards the end of the day, which is very common for people with Alzheimer's and, and dementias, um, setting that scene early greatly reduces the amount of increase you're going to see in those changing behaviours. So, so that's what we really teach. And then, of course, try to make it personal when we're doing cares like hygiene care, administering medication, mealtime, things like that. And um, and the combination of the two means that, yeah, they're probably exposed to music a good three to four to five hours of the day and and we've not seen that be a negative for anyone at this point. That's interesting to know. But it does, you, you make a good point. Not all of it's going to trigger the same feelings or memories. That's right. Um, and that's, that's why the in the app we've got these, you know, relax and energize playlists which are kind of designed to be like radios like you know they're just kind of surfacing songs that we we know will make them feel either way and that can be really helpful to to create that mood as i said so if, you know if you were in that aged care facility and you wanted someone to get up and and dance and move we'd, we'd go energize we're trying to motivate them to get less you know get out of their lethargy and but if we most of the time they're trying to keep them relaxed so they're on the relaxed side but as we find songs through those that trigger the memories for that person, they go in to reminisce. And then when you know you need that impact to, to quicken that person and to get them into the right frame of mind or to intervene if they're escalating their behaviour, um, you got to reminisce because these are the songs you know they know. You know they know the words and you very quickly learn which ones are the kind of hero songs that you can go to to for certain situations. Um, but that's that's probably the, the the way that the whole app is structured. So we want you to be able to to get to that point as effectively and as quickly as you need to, but then also help you understand that just bathing them in music at other times of the day is also incredibly beneficial, and it just helps us find that variety in those other things. I see. What I was looking for when I was searching for music to connect with mom was exactly that was a connection. As I had tried, you know, they say, you know, bring the old family photo albums. So I brought a scrapbook my sister had made of the two of us as children. And my mom had zero clue how these people were. I brought her wedding album. She had zero clue who these people were. I'm like, where is this like long-term memory that they're supposed to be able to pull out of? And that's when I switched to music because my mom would have been very happy if I had just sat around for however long and just, you know, she would just want to sit around and talk which would have been fine because she thought I was her best friend. So she didn't remember our exact relationship, but you know, I was somebody that she enjoyed. So that wasn't too bad, but she asked the same questions over and over and over until the point where you're like, okay, I've answered this question, you know, five times, five different ways. It's been 20 minutes. I can't do this anymore. You know, like I, I got better things to do than sit around and answer the same question all the time. So that was my struggle. And so that's what I went searching for music and, as I said, I was not very successful with that. <laughs> it's, I mean, as I said, it's it's hard. We can't expect, you know, most people to to know what to play. And and if you take your example, because obviously you were spending a lot of time and focus on your mother and you knew her well, imagine if you are a carer in an aged care facility and you're caring for 80 or 100 different people who have dementia. You don't know them really that well. Uh, their name and when they came in like how the hell are you supposed to know what to play for them and that so that's that's the real problem we're solving for you know the the families that we talk to some people love the idea of Vera because it does help them find those songs but others say hey I already know what they like and and it's fine we don't need this and that's great and we just say we try to then just 
encourage and teach them about the ways to use the music. But when we go into that residential aged care setting, no one's got time and no one has any idea what to play. And so that's that's where we find the true value in the product is in that setting. It's um, incredibly needed. And um, and as I said, it leads to when after a, a, a site has been using our our tools for about three months, it, it I, I hand on my heart say that it is transformed. Like you walk in there, if you walked in there to begin with, it, as I said, cold, sterile, weird noises. You know, you walk in there after we're done. Most of the time, it's a really welcoming, calm sound bath. You know, and you've got lots of people who are kind of just enjoying themselves and even starting to converse with each other a lot more and things like that. So, and that that just grows over time. But the um, I can't stress enough that you know, interacting socially, what you were doing with your mother is is the key. And music for the family can provide often a really great bridge to to find something to talk about and to bond over. Um, because often I, I've seen it myself when I, I was a teenager, I'd go to visit my grandfather and I didn't know what to say. And if I did engage in a conversation, it was similar to what you experienced. I was well, going around in circles. So my dad just used to sell, tell me, well, just bring your guitar and just play him some songs. And, and that was the way I spent time with him in those years. I used to just come and play songs and he loved it. And he'd tap along and some of them he could sing along to. And, and again, I had no idea at the time that this was anything, <laughs> anything valuable or scientific. Um, but, but it gave me the opportunity to connect with him. And, um, and I think, yeah, hopefully Vera can do that for other families out there. Yeah, that would be wonderful. Because that was my biggest struggle was making connections with my mom. And she obviously craved it. Um, I had a tendency, well, we ended up, my solution was I would take her to the park or the library or someplace where she could watch young children, which when people asked you, what are you going to do today? I'm like, going to go to the park and watch kids. Sounds a little creepy. <laughs> but it because we were out in nature and it was quieter, you know, there wasn't a lot of industrial noises you know she lived in a care home with i think there was 32 people total was the the maximum number and she for a while had two friends all three of them had the same name which was confusing as hell <laughs> it was ah, just like just to make matters work. oh yeah you know because you couldn't say well where's your friend diane she's like i'm diane i know but the other diane and so <laughs> So we literally called, so mom was Diane, we had other Diane and other, other Diane. <laughs> Just, oh, man. Yeah, um, it was funny. But she would get into mischief with them, which was great. But other Diane started getting very paranoid, and so my mom pulled away from her. And other, other Diane, when I first, when she was first there, I thought she was a visitor. Her hair was nice, her makeup was nice, she seemed, you know, slightly confused but more confused like I'm not sure how to navigate what's going on in this care home and then but she declined really fast and so my mom separated from her too because you know that's not particularly fun but it would have just been nice sometimes I would take my mom and one of the other Diane's to the park because they could talk to each other and then that that took the burden off of me of trying to like not lose my mind while talking to my mother. <laughs> but, you know, after a while, I couldn't do that because the first day I was getting very paranoid and that was just a risky situation. So we stopped, we had to stop doing that. It was just the two of us until, well, the end of 2019, she fell a couple times. And then in March of 2020, she fell and broke her leg and passed away March 31st, 2020. So I got to skip all the ugly end and all the COVID restrictions that happened and, but it was still, it was still, it was still a struggle. So I, I would have liked to have connected with her better. That's kind of, I don't want to say a regret. It was a challenge that I couldn't solve. And so it's exciting to learn about something like Vera that would have probably helped a lot. You know, as I've said to a lot of people, my mom liked talk radio and um, TV talk shows. So I probably should have just found her you know, I should have just played played her some true crime podcasts. There's only a million yeah. more of those, and you know, see what she liked. But I always I knew she couldn't track with them, and so I just I was really hung up on finding the right music, and it just never 
never played out. So I'm glad that you guys came up with Vera and I hope other people will give it a try because it sounds pretty interesting. I may have to put plunk in my details because I have a really eclectic music taste. I really like alternative music, but alternative from the eighties, but I like current alternative. Just depends on my mood. Like what am I in the mood for music wise? Yeah. No, it, you should do it. It's um, it's a really fun experience to see what Vera suggests. And, you know, the one thing we always stress is it's it's not designed to find your favorite songs because if you know those, you can plug them in, but it's designed to find things you will recognize. And so, and over time, we'll find more and more things you recognize the more you use it. So that's, um, that's just one thing to stress because a lot of people go, oh, I didn't find my favorite song by the Bee Gees and they're like okay well that's kind of impossible just think about what you're asking but do you recognize the songs you're hearing yes um good do you know the lyrics to some of them oh yeah okay great that's that's what we're trying to achieve well I was a teenager in the 80s you know a top 40 radio was popular and you heard the same song five million times I love the joke that the lady calls the records the, the radio station says can you please stop playing this song and like, but lady, it sold 5 million copies. I know you've played all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> so I not having remembered music from earlier. So just the eighties and beyond is my, is my zone, I guess you would say. I mean, there's probably songs from the seventies that would trigger memories. So I'm going to, I'm going to play with Vera, but you know, I, I, I can picture it. It's going to pick tip. All those top 40 songs from the 80s. It will. It will. That's that's basically what it's going to do. It's going to find all, this, all those big hits, probably the ones that got a lot of radio play, and you'll know them, and you'll sing along. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like Michael Jackson's album Thriller? I'm sure that's all in there. <laughs> it's, I'm sure that's that, that one had multiple number ones. So, yeah, it'll be fun. I appreciate this. I very much appreciate your guys' efforts sleeping in cars and flying back and forth between California and Australia. That's got to be rough. Oh, and yeah. I hope, I hope you guys have a lot of success because your success will make caregivers lives easier. Thank you. And that's really what we're about. We, we, we care the most about impacting people's lives. And as I said, we just saw the incredible impact that music and memory had and thought that's got to be scaled and available to anyone who's going through this because you need all the help you can get, and and this can really help. Well, that's what I'm here for every week. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for having me on. It's been a pleasure. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs> <laughs>